My name is Nick Morris and I'm a consultant gynaecologist based in London. Sanji Silva, an ENT surgeon and I, have set up the Sapien Care Group to provide everyone with the opportunity to watch and listen to the decision makers and influencers who are now talking about the COVID-19 pandemic. Today with our colleague Jonathan Uko from Life Sciences Integrates, we aim to deliver topical and varied webinars over the coming weeks and months. Today Sanjeev and I are honoured to welcome our panel for today's topic, COVID Ready. David Nabarro is a professor at the Institute of Global Health at Imperial College and one of the WHO's special envoys on COVID. David in February was one of the first public health doctors to highlight the dangers of COVID to our nation. Sapien Care is therefore delighted to welcome him as our first speaker. Our panellists for today also include Sir Nicholas Heitner, the co-founder and co-director of the London Theatre Company, the acclaimed cellist Stephen Isselis, who's kindly recorded the Sarah Band from Bach's third cello suite in C, and Joseph Wallash, who will talk about his journey with COVID. The idea from today's uh, for today's webinar came from not only listening to David and what he's explained to us over the last few months, but also the discussions I've had with Nick and Stephen and with Stafford and, and Sanjeev. The idea of society, culture and life post-Covid and the importance of science in keeping culture alive. The moderator for today's webinar is Professor Stafford Lightman, the Professor of Medicine at Bristol University. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And it's an enormous pleasure to be able to participate in this. And certainly uh, my interest is very much in where the world is going post-COVID uh, rather than just what all the problems are at the present time about COVID. But my first job is really to introduce David Nabarro, who is the co-director of the Imperial College Institute of Global Health Innovation at Imperial College London, and also supports systems leadership for sustainable development through the Switzerland-based social enterprise 4SD. From March 2020, David was appointed special envoy of, of uh, WHO Director General on COVID-19. Previously, he was Director for Human Development in the UK Department for International Development and held leadership roles in the United Nations system on disease outbreaks and health issues, food insecurity and nutrition, climate change and sustainable development. Clearly, he's the perfect person to really open this webinar series. And perhaps, David, uh, I, I could invite you to give your talk and also tell us why you wanted to call your talk COVID Ready. Thank you, David. Thank you very much indeed, Stafford. Thank you, all colleagues, for this opportunity. I started working with Tedros, the Director General of the World Health Organization, on COVID-19 at the end of January. Uh, he asked me to be his advisor, which was kind of special because uh, some may know that I competed with Tedros to become head of the World Health Organization in 2017. So I was kind of really pleased that he was prepared to have me as his colleague uh, in this particular really massive challenge. Right at the beginning, when I started this work, I was conscious that because this is a coronavirus, we have to treat it with ex extraordinary respect. Other coronaviruses have caused major challenges, uh, particularly the one that caused SARS, severe acute respiratory syndrome in East Asia in 2003, and the one that caused Middle Eastern respiratory syndrome more recently. And we've learned about these coronaviruses, that they, that they are rather stable, highly transmissible, unfortunately quite dangerous for humanity, and that if we underestimate them, they will haunt us and affect us badly. And so since I started working on COVID with the WHO, really intensively from the beginning of February and more so during March this year, the one thing that I've worked on is to amplify the WHO's guidance that if a COVID outbreak starts in any location, the immediate requirement is to close it down immediately by interrupting transmission. And that means finding people with the disease, 
and isolating them quickly, finding those with whom they've been in contact, isolating them as well, and protecting individuals who are particularly vulnerable in the face of this threat. But the challenge is that you have to isolate when there are only a few cases. And it's so easy for people to say, well, this isn't very serious. Why should we be going to all this trouble for a disease that in, in their view might be relatively mild? And we heard in February and March, a number of leaders saying, this is not, not much more serious than an influenza outbreak. So what we should do is wait until herd immunity develops and then we can all settle down and we'll be able to deal with this virus as an as a ever-present threat, but we don't need to worry about it. The reason why in the World Health Organization we thought that was erroneous was that we were seeing from experience in China, in South Korea, in Singapore, and in other parts of East Asia, that the only way to respond to this virus was rapid action, closing down outbreaks or suppressing outbreaks. And if outbreaks did build up, containing them as rapidly as possible so as to protect health services, and in particular, prevent health workers from being exposed to a high risk of infection. Well, of course, what's happened since February is history, but it's recent history. And, and just three points before I, I stop this introduction. Number one, continue to take this virus seriously. Don't underestimate it. Its capacity to build up and cause explosive disease outbreaks is now being well recorded in many different locations. Secondly, the virus isn't going to go away just because we've got intense outbreaks right now. And we're talking about flattening the curve. That doesn't mean that the virus will be gone. After all, these lockdowns are reducing rates of transmission, but they're not actually getting rid of the virus. And as lockdowns are reduced and people start moving all over again, we've got to recognize that the virus will still be being transmitted. My third point is that that means that all societies everywhere have to be COVID ready. That means able to defend themselves against the virus through interrupting transmission effectively and able to respond rapidly when new outbreaks build up. And that will mean that from time to time, focal lockdowns will have to be introduced. But the emphasis will be on stopping people coming out of areas where there is virus and going and infecting other areas. And that means that the lockdowns will focus a lot on people's movements. And as we've seen, because it's already happening in Singapore and in Germany, that is part of the containment strategy. So being COVID ready means being able to defend against the virus, having health systems ready so that staff are not exposed, adopting physical distancing practices in business and in social relations so as to reduce the risk of outbreaks building up, and being ready to contain and suppress outbreaks once they do emerge. But just Remember, that yes, it's older people, people with concomitant illness, people who are actively involved in treating people with COVID, who are all at risk. And so there will be the need in all societies to find ways to protect or even shield those who are most at risk. But that's got to be done without isolating them. And part of what's going to happen in the world in the coming few, few weeks and months is a collective shift in our behaviors so that we're able to go about our social lives and our economic lives and our cultural lives with the constant threat of this virus, whilst at the same time, as we protect people, making sure that we don't isolate them. Lots of work to come. And now I'm very pleased to answer one or two questions if that's helpful. Thank you very much indeed, David. That's extremely helpful. Uh, as you uh, may not be surprised, we've had a huge number of questions for you. 
uh, and uh, I've selected a few which I, I thought would be pertinent to were the sort of things that haven't been, some of them haven't been discussed discussed in a lot of detail before. Can I start with a, a question from Helena Kennedy? Uh, she wants to know, does temperature testing have any value at all? This is done in some countries at airports and indeed is being discussed by some companies as a way of monitoring the workforce. I've been talking to a number of company CEOs about what they're going to do to try to make sure their workplaces are COVID ready. And one of the questions they ask me often is how we're we going to enable our employees to know whether or not they might have COVID and whether they should be ready to self isolate so that they're not endangering others. And of course, one of the signs of COVID infection is a fever, along with dry cough, and together with shortness of breath and perhaps sometimes chest pain, preceded by a number of other symptoms that are relatively non-specific. So there is a rationale for using temperature taking as one of the ways to identify people who might have COVID in the workplace setting. The only difficulty and I'm sure everybody on this seminar has picked this up, is that not everybody presents with the same symptoms. And so there's likely to be a number of people with COVID missed through temperature taking. And secondly, of course, a fever could be due to something else, not just COVID. So there's a lack of specificity with temperature taking as well. So what to do? Well, it's not going to be possible for companies to offer everybody a virus testing using PCR at the workplace. Just too difficult. And for the time being, at least, I think it's actually rather impracticable in many settings. And so temperature testing taking will be used as a proxy. And all I'm going to say is that it's relatively insensitive, not very, very specific. And so we should use it but we should also ask people about their symptoms. And particularly if they've had some symptoms before they developed a fever, where they lost a sense, their sense of smell and taste, or where they had various peculiar blotches on the back of their uh, feet and hands, or even uh, whiteness of e e extremities, particularly toes and, and fingers, then that also might add to the symptom picture. But I think more generally, Combining temperature taking with a symptom check is probably the best that can be done in the absence of testing, and I believe should be done. And in the terms of screening at airports, is, is that as good as we can get? Well, I know that some companies are trying now to use antibody tests to see whether or not they can pick up people. Of course, everybody knows that an antibody test has one small disadvantage, which is that the antibodies will only build up some days after the start of infection. And again, there's a problem about sensitivity and specificity. So I, I applaud the airlines that have started to do it, but I appreciate that they're not sure how useful it is. And I think inevitably, temperature taking will be part of the defense mechanism at airports. And I, as I say, I think it's better than nothing but it should not give anybody a false sense of security. We saw that with Ebola in West Africa, where temperature taking was often done at points of departure and arrival. And it helps, but it's probably not enough. And that's why the work to develop more uh, effective point of care diagnostic, diagnostics is really important for resume, resumption of air travel and a measure of security for those who are transporting people in airplanes. Well, thank you very much. Uh, our second question is from, well, from two people who, who've written very similar questions. This is from John Terry and Alison Kay. And, and they would very much like to know what your thinking is about the knock-on consequences of COVID in terms of impact on healthcare provision for other life-impacting chronic health conditions. Thinking of things like epilepsy or cancer treatment, because these have been very much put on hold with all of COVID going on, and what your feelings are about where this is going to take us in the future. I think, again, everybody who's involved in healthcare, who's on this um, webinar, is going to have noticed that there's been a real cutback in routine 
health care, in general practice surgeries, in hospitals, and also in specialist units. And whether it's people who've got cancer, or people who've got chronic diseases, or simply people who want a, a routine care for their children, like immunization, uh, they're, they're not getting it because the services have been really cut back, partly because of the need to repurpose healthcare facilities so that they're COVID ready, and partly because health professionals have been very busy working on COVID and COVID related issues and haven't been able to do more normal care. But let me give an example again from West Africa when I was working on Ebola in 2015. We had real anxieties that basic care for women and children was just not happening. And we had evidence that there were children who were getting sick and dying from other conditions and not as a result of Ebola. And so at that time, we were particularly concerned about the impact of dealing with an acute condition in an emergency on basic health care. I don't have a simple solution for this, but I do encourage everybody everywhere, particularly now we're moving into this COVID ready environment where we'll have to be organized to deal with COVID as well as to maintain other services of the importance to keep basic health facilities going. Otherwise, we're going to find in a year or two's time when the epidemiology is done, that we may well have ended up losing more people to non-COVID conditions than to COVID itself. So let's make absolutely certain that the rest of clinical care, the rest of preventive health care, and the rest of basic health services can be kept going as well as possible, despite the fact that we're also adding the extra layer of being COVID ready. Well, thank you, Raj. That, that really takes us to the next question, which is very much related to this, because it's clear that medical care is likely to change uh, after COVID. And uh, Matt Houghton uh, would like to ask you, what telehealth innovations the World Health Organization believe, believes can be a game changer, especially in developing countries? Thank you very much to Matt. Uh, now, uh, let me give you some examples that WHO is hearing just to show how widespread greater use of telemedicine is becoming. For indigenous communities in northern Canada, there has been the introduction of telehealth in order to explain to people what are the options if they might have COVID and to identify those who are going to need referral to hospital care which may require air transport. Telemedicine is absolutely critical in those kinds of settings. We're hearing about it being used in Australia. We hear about it being used in Angola, where a colleague has been setting up telehealth in order to enable uh, medical personnel dealing with cases of COVID, or perhaps there may be others, but they're not sure whether they're COVID, uh, again, away from Luanda. We're hearing about telemedicine in France. We're hearing about telemedicine in different parts of Britain. It's quite obvious now that telemedicine or telehealth care in various forms is going to become more and more important for providing advice to people when they are not able to come to meet physically with a healthcare provider. Some of this telehealth care is being linked to apps that enable people to put in their symptoms using a smartphone and get those symptoms reviewed at a triad center. I've heard of one by Professor Jordan in Ile de France in France, and I'm really impressed by the way in which that one's working. I'm also hearing about potential quite widespread services being run by major software providers, again, where you've got the opportunity of scale so that as well as the symptoms of individuals being uh, made available uh, for an individual practitioner, anonymized data that can then be put together and collected on very large volumes in order to give some indication of where symptoms are building up. I think we're just at the beginning of this, Stafford, and I think it's going to be really important. Our colleagues in WHO are receiving numerous 
uh, new apps that have been developed for this kind of work, either for use on laptop computers or for use on smartphones or even for use on flip phones, which can uh, simply provide data through SMS rather than through access to broadband. And I think that we will find that telemedicine in telehealth are going to be given a huge boost as a result of responding to COVID. Well, that sounds much like a very positive uh, uh, effect, which will actually be helping healthcare in the future. Yeah. Well, going down the same, uh, a, a similar line uh, about this, uh, I have a question here from Nello Cristianini, who would like to know is, what's the actual real and scientific value of digital contact tracing? What he, the sort of question he really wants to know is, how many positives do you find per each test? among people who've been selected by contact tracing? Yeah. Well, first, there's a lot of pieces to Nello's question. Number one, uh, most of the ex experience we have from dealing with COVID in the last five months is that contact tracing really matters. If you do want to interrupt transmission and prevent chains and then outbreaks from developing, it's not good enough just to identify individuals with the disease and isolate them. It's also necessary to find those with whom they've been in contact. Now, by this, I mean close contact for quite a number of minutes. And I'm also saying from two days before their symptoms started because of our belief that infectivity is high at the beginning of a COVID episode. Uh, contact tracing matters. I talk a lot to colleagues working in Mumbai, formerly Bombay in India. They've been working really hard in a highly populated area called Dharavi to get contact tracing in place and to use the contact tracing and isolation of contacts as a way to interrupt transmission and keep that virus from spreading widely. And they've done remarkably well. At the same time, one of the variables they look at is what percentage of those who are contacted turn out to be positive. In India, it's been pretty static. Uh, they, they've run with something like four or five percent of contacts testing positive. And, and that, I think, is very interesting because it does mean that contact tracing is important and it does mean that this is an approach that is useful for interrupting transmission. But then we go one step further and we say, are these apps kind of being rolled out in Australia? It's called COVID Safe, or one that's being rolled out in Egypt, famous one that's been rolled out in South Korea, and the one in Israel. Are these apps really useful? Well, we go back to what's the basis of COVID containment. And I want to keep stressing it's identifying people with the disease, isolating them, finding their recent contacts, isolating them and protecting the most vulnerable, whilst of course making sure that people with disease who need medical care can get it. Why do I keep going on about that? Because I think it really matters. It was exactly like this with Ebola. We had to get everybody aware that these key elements of dealing with infectious disease just can't be shortcut. You can't do it with an app, with tech. You can't overcome the fact that what we call shoe leather epidemiology, walking around and finding the people who have the disease and the contacts and then getting them isolated, that is the heart of interrupting transmission. In Singapore, where they've had an upsurge in cases because of high levels of COVID in foreign worker dormitories, they've had to do it. The shoe leather epidemiology, they brought on staff from Singapore Airlines who are not flying. And they were very happy to come along and help. Or in Germany, uh, where a Robert Koch Institute has been leading such a lot of this, they brought in medical students to be contact tracers. So an app may well be useful, but don't lose sight of the reality that that core shoe leather epidemiology is the key. In Britain, they're calling it an army of contact tracers for the track and uh, trace um, uh, strategy. And, and that, I think, is going to be the shape of the future. Being able to find people with disease and isolate them, being able to find contacts and isolate them, if an app helps, 
rate, but we can't rely solely on the app. We have to have the full package and only then will we be COVID ready. That's great. I think that message comes across extremely clearly. Thank you very much indeed. And there's one final question, which is it, it, rather uh, different from, from rather a different viewpoint. It's not a medical viewpoint, but it's really, this is an architectural viewpoint. And it's a question from Mark Feinberg. And he is an architect. And what he'd like to know is how should architects reevaluate how we live, work and interact within the home reducing densities, improving space standards for home working and social distancing within, within houses of multiple occupation? Well, thanks, Mark, for the question. And, uh, and what I want to do is just simply ask everybody to look at this, not just from a British perspective, but from a truly global perspective. And let's just ask ourselves now, what is COVID ready going to mean in a variety of different sectors? I'll just give a few examples. What does it mean for agriculture and food where so much of what happens, not so much on the farm, but in the markets where food produce is brought involves close physical contact? And what's it gonna mean for restaurants which buy agricultural produce suddenly they're not buying it. So farmers all over the world are facing a huge crisis. What about prisons? We've got prisoners closely cooped up together and we've got riots in jails all over. Some of them we hear about, some of them are perhaps less well publicized, partly because the prisoners are scared and partly because the staff in prisons are getting a high level of sickness. Uh, and that in turn creates problems. Well, let's take another area. Um, old people, care for older people, and we're getting close to what Mark was talking about. How on earth is residential care for older people going to evolve so that it's COVID ready and COVID safe for the foreseeable future? And so we come to Mark's broader question. What's the implications of this for how we organize our spatial arrangements? I think it's huge. I think living with the constant threat of COVID is going to force a lot of thinking about basic design for habitations. And it's going to require all of us to focus on whether or not we're prepared to tolerate a world in which an awful lot of poor people are required to live in very densely populated settings. They're called slums in some countries, favelas, townships, but whatever they're called, basically they don't enable an individual in a household to isolate. They don't even enable whole households to isolate. And if they do isolate parts of communities, as we've seen in slums in Mumbai, then you get all sorts of challenges about lavatories, about access to water, about access to food. So yes, I quite agree with you, Mark. I was just checking your name. I wrote it down on my notepad. When you're doing these things, you have to keep looking at the camera, but you sometimes have to avert your eyes. I was just thinking, Mark, you are so right. I think this is a massive lifestyle redesign issue that's coming along. Because I keep finding COVID, we've known about it for five months, it's revealing so many fra fragilities and vulnerabilities in the way we live. So many challenges for poorer people who are going to be asked to put up with incredible shifts to how they live in order to try to reduce the risk of this virus. And we are going, all of us, I think, to have to be ready for new standards on dwellings, new standards on physical layout of buildings and so on and new standards on our interaction, as long as this threat is with us. Now, I don't know how long it's gonna be, but it's long enough, I think, Mark, for this kind of redesign to go on. And I look forward to hearing more about what you're gonna do on it. Thank you. David, thank you very, very much indeed. And I now totally understand why you gave your talk the title of COVID Ready. 
because clearly it is not, this is not just a medical problem. This is a, a social problem in a very major, major way. And yeah. It's going to affect our lives in many, many ways. Thank yeah. you so much for an incredibly informative talk. If you'd like to stay in and listen to any more, then obviously you're very welcome to do so. But Thank now you. we're going to move, move on to Joseph Wallace. Joseph has actually had COVID and he's going to tell us about his journey with COVID. Joseph. Thank you. Thank you, for Professor Lightman. It's uh, great to get the opportunity to share my story with such an esteemed panel and, and audience. Uh, so I'm a 40 year old a tech entrepreneur, fairly fit and healthy. I've got no underlying health conditions. I live in South London with my small family, my wife and my two, two young daughters. Um, my COVID experience really starts back in uh, on the 11th of March, where I started to feel quite unwell while enjoying an evening out with a few colleagues after work. When I returned home, I had a severe shivers, joint aches, which really quickly progressed into quite a strong fever, where I had real problems regulating my temperature. This lasted for several days before I started to experience a chesty dry cough. I was completely exhausted by this time. Um, due to these symptoms getting worse, and it now being, I think it was day eight, uh, my wife decided that it was, it was definitely time to call in some professional support. So we tried to, to, to contact a, a doctor. Uh, we uh, ended up using telemedicine, as, as David Navarro uh, mentioned. We had a telephone uh, conference, a video conference with a doctor. Um, and that doctor advised that we, that we should call an ambulance. Um, I had a bedside assessment, um, which was carried out by the ambulance crew, and I was rushed to St. Thomas's um, Hospital in central London for, for further treatment. My COVID test came back around about 30 hours after I was tested. There were some delays at that time. It's a fairly early time for the pandemic in London and the hospitals and, and basically society and how they were trying to deal with, with the effects of, uh, of, of, of COVID um, within, within London. After a short stint in ICU, I spent a total of five days in hospital receiving constant oxygen, painkillers, antibiotics, blood thinners, uh, before being well enough uh, to be discharged. It was obviously a very surreal experience being treated by doctors and nurses with all the protective equipment. Um, as I said, it was still an early time in London dealing with uh, the pandemic. It's taken me quite a few weeks um, to start to regain my strength, being able to sleep properly, eating properly, bring, get my focus back. Uh, but thankfully, I'm feeling much, much better now. I would like to just take a second to thank, obviously, all of the doctors and nurses and the frontline workers that played a part in my care, and as well as all of those still that are out there tirelessly caring for our nation and all the other uh, nations around the world. Um, it's great to see some of these communities coming together at this time. Um, and how they're dealing you know, with, with, with the circumstances that are unplaying in real time uh, it, within our communities. As we start to see the reduced number of cases, I think it's important to really stay vigilant, sticking to the isolation measures and taking precautions to continue to reduce the load on our healthcare systems and essentially save lives. As you can see from my uh, ex example, it really can affect anyone at any time uh, with any circumstances that they're particularly in at that at that moment. I believe a strategy of testing and isolation will get Britain breathing again and on, on the road to recovery, just like in my case. So I'd like to thank you for listening to my COVID-19 experience. Keep safe and I wish you all good health. Well, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Nicholas Heitner. Nicholas Heitner was director of the National Theatre from 2003 to 2015, with many highly acclaimed productions from Shakespeare to his Dark Materials, The History Boys, and One Man, Two Governors. He's also directed the films The Madness of King George and The Lady in the Van. He's co-founder and co-director of the London Theatre Company, and is currently producing and directing a new production of Alan Bennett's Talking Heads for the BBC. This is a real challenge with current social distancing. And indeed, I think we're very fortunate that he's been able to find this slot in his time to come and talk with us. In our current COVID lockdown, there's been almost back-to-back -back discussion in the media on the challenges of COVID to science and medicine. 
but the massive effects of COVID on the arts and humanities, which provide such vital aspects of our social and intellectual life, have been sidelined. So it's really very important that we have such powerful voices as Nicholas Heitner and later Stephen Isselis on this webinar. Nick, David Nabarro has discussed in some detail how the world might become COVID ready to protect us from coronavirus. Perhaps you could let us know what your thoughts are on how the world might become COVID ready for the arts. Well, we really need to find a way of gathering people together uh, in groups. Uh, it doesn't really uh, matter uh, how big those groups are to begin with. Um, but people have to be able to gather together under the same roof uh, to experience the things that for many of them uh, make life worth living. So uh, obviously I join this discussion with absolutely no scientific or medical expertise at all. But I do know that, um, that as soon as uh, the world gets moving again, uh, we, particularly the performing artists, uh, are going to be looking for ways to bring people together uh, and to bring people together safely and with confidence. Uh, the, um, the performing arts can't exist in isolation. Uh, artists have been unbelievably inventive, inspiringly inventive over the last few weeks, uh, reaching people um, through on new platforms online. Um, uh, artists like Stephen Isselis have been have been uh, reaching their old audience as well as big new audiences. Theatres have been reaching big audiences as well, the old and new, um, via, via the online world. But in the end, what we do is about being in the same room at the same time. That, that is, that's what, it is the making of music uh, by real people to real people. It's the performance of drama by real people to real people, which are the bedrock of the performing arts. So, um, so it, it, we can't, we just, we just, at the moment, can't imagine um, existing indefinitely in isolation. So whatever the scientific and medical solutions are uh, to allowing people to congregate again, we're not expecting, nobody is expecting this to happen overnight. Um, but whatever those solutions are, we're looking, we're, we're looking to be told about them. Nick, I wonder if you could just tell us how you have been uh, actually preparing for Talking Heads in the current situation. Well, Talking Heads is, uh, these are 12 uh, monologues uh, written by Alan Bennett, that, uh, 10 of them old, two of them new. They're great classics of television history. It was a BBC suggestion that because they're monologues, because they're performed, each of them by one actor, it might be possible to find a way uh, to make them while observing all the social distancing protocols. And it's, um, it's a great encouragement to me. It, it, it took me just a few days. This was a, a, a pipe dream only four or five weeks ago. It took me just a few days to call around people who are great experts in their various crafts, uh, camera, costume, hair and makeup, um, and actors, uh, and, uh, and it, it took me a few days to ask them, can you do this without coming closer than two meters to anybody else? You know, if you think about it, um, how do you make an actor up? Uh, how do you do an actor's hair uh, without touching an actor? And the answer is, um, the actor does herself, the designer stands at a distance, um, the scene is lit, the camera operator rehearses without the actor. The actor comes onto the set and is never is never within, I think, you know, further than two meters. I think I think I think nobody on the set um, even approaches the, the two meter distance. This won't work um, at, uh, under current protocols. Uh, if you have to see to, to shoot a scene of two people having an intense conversation over a dinner table. Um, but it works for one person. Um, we've already made six of these monologues. We're just about to embark on the next six. This has been done really quickly. The significance is not that there's any great trick, any great genius uh, to this. The, the, um, the significance is in the pragmatism of the BBC, 
what can we make? What kind of drama can we make? We can make monologues. Here are these great classic monologues. Can we find people who can work out a way of making them properly? This isn't, you know, this isn't stuff done in, in, um, in the actor's own homes. This is stuff done under proper conditions in a proper TV studio. We're adapting existing sets that stand here already at Elstree Studios. Um, and they'll be able to go out within a matter of, uh, of three or four weeks. Uh, it's, it's a sign of how flexible uh, people who make TV drama are prepared to be. But it's, in our terms as people who work in the theater, a tiny step. Uh, we want to open the doors of our theater again. Um, all theaters want to open their doors. Uh, we will work out uh, as soon as we're able to, uh, we will work out, we're already talking about it, how to get people in, how to keep them at a safe distance from each other. We're obviously totally dependent on, um, on the uh, um, uh, tracking and testing and, uh, and all, the, all the stuff that you're talking about much, much more knowledgeably than I ever can. Um, we're, we're, we're going to be totally dependent on that, but um, uh, you can't, you can't keep a ballet dancer at home forever. Ballet dancer has to get out there and dance. Well, we really, we really appreciate that this is a start, and certainly I, for one, and I'm sure the rest of us, uh, can't wait until we find a, a solution to doing this in with, with lots of people and the more. Uh, more as we used to do it in the past. It's actually quite timely that we can move on from this to uh, Stephen Isselis, who was meant to be playing in Carnegie Hall about this present time, but couldn't do this, but very kindly uh, actually recorded Saraband for us, uh, actually in his own kitchen. I think I've waited five seconds. <laughs> Anybody else coming in? <laughs> that was great, Nick, thanks. Uh, no, it's not rocket science. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, but it's people don't people don't talk about it, and most of us would just it would, you know, the thought of losing of the arts and uh, you know, not having access to the arts is just so horrendous, and the 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 media just really haven't concentrated on that at all. It's just been bang 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 monotony of repeated comments about coronavirus, which I personally find is becoming unbelievably boring but um yeah but we've got whole we've got whole com I, I didn't want to get into we've got whole conversations about you know with there's there's various different sectors in the performing arts there's there's the subsidized sector there's the not-for-profit uh, sector that doesn't have subsidy and, and our theater works um as a business and there are ways that there are ways of um easing the passage back for all of us and but, but it will take money and, and, and we have to now somehow get ourselves back onto the government agenda where it's, um, there are ways of doing it that are going to be, that are going to be um, in expenditure terms, barely noticeable for government. Um, but uh, you know, as ever, um, when, when, when we're never high up the list of any government's agenda, certainly not this one. With Stephen, do you, do you want to comment this from a musician's point of view of where, where you see we might be going? Well, we're the same, exactly the same situation, really. I mean, but it's, I don't see that it's going to happen soon because even on stage, people have to be so close together. It's quite interesting that actually I wasn't going to be playing Carnegie Hall now. We just did that extraordinary thing where pianists recorded the piano part of a Mendelssohn Trio movement in New York State. They sent me the video. I recorded the cello part and then um, sent it off to my friend Joshua Bell, the violinist, in, who was also in New York State, somewhere else, and he recorded the violin part, and they put it together as a trio, which is quite interesting, actually. Um, but not a substitute for the real thing. And um, it's quite interesting, though, in the States, I was meant to be doing a big tour this summer, and they haven't all cancelled yet. But I feel a bit uncomfortable at the moment, but, you know, with its um, sort of outdoor concerts, with about 5,000 people there at the Tanglewood Festival. And um, I'd feel sort of responsible if old people were there and then got ill. I mean, it's, it's a big dilemma. And we just, can, yeah. Can I ask you something, Stephen? Because I really, I don't know the answer to this. What would you feel about performing at Wigmore Hall to 100 people um, and making that concert available 
online would that not be better than doing it from your home does isn't would 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 the, would the event of a hundred people coming together safely to listen to you in a proper concert hall be important to you or can or 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 is it or is it just as good um to no. to make to make music at home no a hundred people of the right people would be mm. um be terrific i mean i suggested that to the Wigmore Hall when this all started. That we, I mean, just playing in the Wigmore Hall, even without an audience has, I mean, the Wigmore Hall has its ghosts, it has its atmosphere. Be hugely different from playing in my kitchen, which I thought I would never do, but I have done a lot now because there's no choice. Um, and I'm lucky that my son and his girlfriend are living here and that my son can video it all and my girlfriend, his girlfriend, not my girlfriend, his girlfriend is a violinist. We can play duets, I'm going to do that for children soon. But um, no, I think Wigmore Hall, I think they did things like that during the Spanish flu, that they had half empty or third empty halls. And yeah, it make a big difference. If you're just playing for a hundred people is different from playing in an empty Wigmore Hall and streaming it. But playing in an empty Wigmore Hall and streaming it is better than playing in your kitchen. Mm -hmm. But playing in your kitchen is better than not playing at all. So. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and it's just, I mean, in a way we musicians are lucky. I'm, spending wonderful times just looking at the Bach suites for pleasure at the moment but just but for actors it's a little more tricky you do need other people except I suppose for monologues like the ones you're talking about but I don't know but financially god knows how the orchestras are going to survive and Glyndebourne's just announced they cancelled the whole season and the two orchestras that play there all summer are completely dependent on that income so we shall see but I'm interested to hear you say that the government they would the government would hardly notice the expenditure. No, no, they really wouldn't. In in the grand scheme of things, there are there are levers that could be pulled. But for things like orchestras, um, for 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 um, you know big dance companies, um, for big institutions and individual artists, uh, if they care then they've, they've got to be there to make sure there is a cultural infrastructure at the end of it. Um, you know, there's a, a lot of our cultural interest, infrastructure. People forget. Stevens just mentioned the Wigmore Hall during the Spanish flu. It's, it's, it's decades, in some cases, centuries old. And it, it's just inconceivable, inconceivable to me that you could let that go for want of what in the grand scheme of things would be not very much money. It's, it's inconceivable that you would want to let all the artists we have with their collectively centuries, millennia of training and experience um, just go. So we've got, we've got to start lobbying very, very hard. And it, it is difficult in the context of all the money that is needed to um, get through the current emergency, but it, it, it will rapidly turn into, um, it, it, will be, it will rapidly turn into, <laughs> into a kind of um, cultural catastrophe if we can't come out of this with the same cultural infrastructure and the same body of artists as we have going into it. Yeah, I mean, I suppose, trying to look positively, the Arts Council, the formation of the Arts Council was a result of the Second World War, came yeah. after the Second World War, because of things they'd done during the war to try to keep culture alive. That's why the Arts Council was born afterwards. So I suppose we hope that something similar could happen now, we hope. I don't know, I think, you know, there is quite a sort of a will for culture to survive, I think. Okay. Um, I mean, you say this government, I don't think this government would be worse than some others about this. I do think in some ways they might support the arts. I don't know. <laughs> it's hard to, to tell. I, I, I hope so. I think you're right. I do. I think I, I don't, I don't, I don't think they're hostile. I no, think, exactly. I think that, I think it's just. It's, it's much it's, more than our friends across the pond. <laughs> they have big problems, I think. But uh, Angela, Mer Angela Merkel has announced a 1.5 billion euro bailout for geez. her cultural sector. I know, she's wonderful. Germany is wonderful, but I'm thinking more further away. <laughs> no, further away. <laughs> I mean, I know that sort of Trump watches King Lear every night and then listens to the Foreign Requiem every night, but <laughs> it might not translate into practical help. Here, I think we have a better chance. <laughs> Nick, do you, do, you, do you want to sum up? 
Look, I would just like to thank everybody from David, Stephen, Nick, Stafford, all of you for taking part in today. Um, you know, Nick, when, when we first started talking about six weeks ago, we we're all sitting at home in our dressing gowns, looking out in our garden. The only thing to look at were, were a few daffodils. I never thought we'd so quickly get to this point where we can actually challenge and I think one of the things that Sanjeev and I would like to see Sapi and Care do is to set up challenges in the way that you two have been talking today. You and Stephen have been trading the issues that affect you as live performers and how you help the people around you. Stephen with his concern about orchestras, your concern about the whole structure of, of live theatre. You know, Sanjeev and I work in the operating theatre, which is very different. And, and, and staff works in a much more probably more like you do, Nick, but I'd just like to thank all of you for taking part in today. And um, now we have a treat to end with. We have Stephen playing a Saraban by Bach. So I shall leave you with that. And Stephen recorded this in the room where he joined the webinar today. So thank you, everybody. And we look forward to you joining us at uh, Sabian Care's next uh, webinar. And we'll let you know when that will be. But thank you. Thank you, David, Nick, Stephen, uh, Stafford, and thank you everybody at Zoom who's helped us put this together. Bye-bye.